you joined us this morning, would you stand and give God the praise he is due?
there is so much hope that we have as believers because of what Jesus Christ did on a cross for us. On the back of the chair, or for those in the front row, there's a communion right there. Go ahead and grab that. What we do as believers is we practice here at Ken Monday Christian Church what we call open communion. And that is if you identify that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you've made that commitment. We want you to celebrate with us. For those of you online, uh, we want you to do that as well because this is something believers do. We've been uh, almost commanded to do this by Christ. When he was with his disciples, he was sitting with them specifically and as what oftentimes referred to as the Lord's Supper. And during Passover was when this was taking place and he had broken some bread and then he handed that out to the different disciples there and he said to them, do this in remembrance of me. Say, take this. This will help you remember my body. So go ahead and peel back the first layer for those of you here. Go ahead and peel back that first layer. There's a piece of bread there. And just like Jesus did with his disciples, we're doing together today, we want to remember the body. Because it endured an awful lot for us. So let's go ahead and remember that together. Under the next layer is some juice. When Jesus was with his disciples that night, he had some probably wine in a, in a cup, and he says, this is going to help you remember the blood. This as well is what you need to remember. Blood was a big deal then. Blood's a big deal to us. There's not a person in this room that blood's not a big deal to. But what this helps us remember is perfect blood that was sacrificed for us. So let's do that together as well. The hope that we have because of what Jesus has done also extends beyond us. There is, uh, you saw the baptism that was done yesterday. Mabry was uh, the one baptized. She was, had just been at a week of camp over at Oil Belt. And so uh, on her way back, the family called and said, hey, could we you know, do a baptism like right now? And uh, Josh was able to do that. So we're excited about the life change that continues to happen uh, in young and old alike. And those that have known the Lord a long time, those that have known him relatively a short period, we're, we're so excited about what God is doing in the lives of everybody that comes in contact with his church body and family. You have been blessed to be a blessing. That's some uh, not new information for many of you, but that is true nonetheless. There is a, a blessing that you have received, whether it's work or a gift or something like that, that you have gotten throughout the course of a week or the month that you continue to see God's hand. Some of you uh, as farmers realized the rain last night was a huge blessing. And so... You've been blessed to be a blessing, and it continues. So thank you so much for being a part of that, whether you choose to uh, put those donations, those financial gifts, whatever they may be in the, in the boxes towards the back. M maybe you're choosing to do that online. Uh, you do the text to give. That's what Gayla and I choose to do every Friday morning after we get paid. It's a, it's a first fruit thing that we want to do because we want to be a blessing uh, as a result of the blessing that we have received. Thank you for living that way because that is huge. And God is glorified. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus 
that we could receive the ultimate blessing. And as a result, we can respond. We can respond by remembering. We can respond by reacting. Lord, we don't want to be the same as when we came in here this morning. Thank you for that as well. We want to see what you need us to see. We want to experience what you need us to experience. We want to change the way you need us and want us to. Thank you for loving us so, so much. That's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks, Todd. Well, we're having fun today, ain't we? Hey, I am, I am fired up about being here. And I was um, cautiously optimistic when Josh said we're going to do like a 10-week series on, on heaven. And I, I, I said, wow, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a long series. And uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it dispels some things in there that uh, you grow up thinking. But also, I think more than anything, last week really stuck with me as he was talking about um, time crunch. There'll be no more time crunch. There'll be time, but there won't be the time crunch because in my season in my life, time crunch is a big deal. And, you know, you just feel like you're drowning sometimes. And, and some of you feel the same way. Some of you are experiencing that time crunch. But some of you are feeling pain or sickness or hurt or lost, lost a loved one. Uh, we all have a different season and a different, different lane that we're in right now in our life. But for me right now, it, it, I would think it's the time crunch mostly. And so I don't, I don't want to check out today. Uh, but if I truly believe heaven is everything that I say it is and I read and I understand it to be, I probably should want to check out today. Because when we get to heaven, it really is going to be a day of rejoicing. And that day is just never going to end. And it's just going to keep going. And, and I can't imagine no more weeping or hurting or pain. I can't imagine not having to watch the clock. And I'm really looking forward to that. And I hope you're excited about that. But I ultimately hope you're so excited that when you leave these doors today, you share that, ne that message with everyone. And you bring someone with you that needs to hear that. Not just somebody who knows Christ but somebody who doesn't know Christ. Because then they have that hope too that you have. So share that with your family, your friends, the ones you come into contact with. And as we sing this next song, rejoice with us of what a great day that's going to be when we all get there.
And great job, uh, guys. You guys, uh, I, when I asked him to do that song uh, several weeks ago, Kyle told me he hated it and he wouldn't do it. Um, but, <laughs> but I made him. So, uh, no, but th- these guys do an uh, amazing job um, every week. And uh, I'm going to ask to get the house lights up a little bit more if we can today, because I'm going to ask you to take some notes and write some things down as we're in this study or, or this uh, series on heaven called An Amazing Place. And uh, the topic that we're going to deal with today is when we all get to heaven, um, except uh, that's not true. Uh, unfortunately, all of us will, will not get to heaven, because there's only one way uh, to heaven, and that is through, through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for us. And there are some, some in this room, some online, some that we know that, that simply will not accept what he's done, um, and, and therefore uh, they will, will not get to heaven. Uh, which doesn't make me happy, which actually is the, the driving force of, of why I do ministry and, and why we do things in the church the way that we do, is because we want everyone to go to heaven. Uh, Jesus even said that uh, himself, or, or Peter actually said that about God, is that God's not slow in keeping his promise of returning, um, as some say or, or, or some consider slowness, um, but he is patient. He doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Um, and that's our goal. Uh, that, that's what we want. We want everyone to come to repentance, but we also know um, that just that, that's not true. And, and it's interesting to, to speculate on, on the next life, um, especially uh, when it comes to the regard of, of people that we love. Like we're considered, uh, uh, today what we're gonna do is gonna be a little different than normal. Like I'm not gonna do a lot of, of preaching as much as I am just going to do some, some teaching um, and we're going to look at some of the, the most frequent questions that I've received over, over the last 25 years of ministry. Um, and I'm going to try to answer those uh, the best that I can. Um, and I know that these are not going to be perfect answers, because uh, God, in, in his inspiration of the Holy, Holy Scripture, he's left some things to, to faith. So we're going to have to have faith in some of these areas. Um, but I think that the Scripture gives us enough uh, insight in it to encourage us with the answers to some of these questions. Um, and, and I wanna tell you that these questions are not a matters of salvation. Like you can differ from me and, and think, well, he's wrong. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that you're bad, it doesn't mean that you're wrong, it doesn't mean that you're going to hell, and it doesn't mean that I'm bad and that I'm wrong and that I'm going to hell. It just means we have a differing opinion on these things. They're not matters of, of salvation. But what I want you to do today is I want you to, to follow along and if, if you brought something with you, to, to write down the question and then the answer and the verses that I give you to support those answers so that you can form your own opinion um, on these questions. Um, and the first question we're gonna start with is, is where do people go uh, when we die? Where do we go uh, when we die? Like that's a question that, that we often wonder. And back in the Old Testament, there's a lot of misconceptions about this, but back in the Old Testament, uh, the dwelling of the dead was called Sheol. Um, for example, in Psalm 89, 48, it says this. What, can, what man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Other translations say the power of, of the grave. But the actual Hebrew word is Sheol. And it's a place where all of the dead went. The Greek term that would have been carried over into the New Testament was the words Hades. And the Hebrews came to understand Sheol or Hades uh, as the intermediate dwelling place of the dead. And it was made up of two realms in, in the Old Testament. It was made up of two realms, a realm called Paradise for the Righteous and a place called Tartarus for the Wicked. And Jesus even seemed to reinforce that view uh, when he told a parable about Lazarus um, and a rich man. He said, Lazarus died and went to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man went to a place of torment. Jesus also, when he was on the cross, uh, he, the thief w- was repentant. He said, today, you will be with me in, in paradise. And now, this might be something new to, to think about. At this point, it doesn't appear that paradise and heaven are the same place. Because Jesus isn't in heaven for the three days between uh, Calvary and, and his resurrection. Like, we have scripture, John um, uh, 2017, he says, don't cling to me. This is after the resurrection. Mary grabbed onto him. He said, don't cling to me, for I, have yet ascend- I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to, the, to my Father 
and your father to my God and to your God. So apparently the, the saints in the Old Testament could not go to heaven and live in God's presence until their sins were atoned for. Hebrews 10 says that, that the Old Testament, the sacrificial system was, was established just to push their sins forward a year uh, until Calvary. It said that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. Now they weren't in torment. They, they, they were in the place that Jesus calls Abraham's bosom. But until their sins were atoned for, they could not yet enter into the presence of God because God cannot be around sin. And maybe this is what Paul was, was talking about in, in Ephesians 4, 8, when he said, this is why he said, when, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. And Jesus is saying, I am the owner of death and of hates. When he concurred um, death, when he encountered death, he entered the right to open the door of Sheol when he de defeated it. And he released the righteous saints who had been waiting. And after Jesus' ascension from that point on, paradise and heaven are the same place. Paul would write about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. He says he was caught up into paradise and he heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. And it's also interesting that in the, the New Testament after Jesus' ascension, the righteous dead are always referred to as being in heaven. Heaven is a, a spiritual dimension of a reality which God has hidden from us, where Jesus now lives in his resurrected body. So when the righteous die, their spirits immediately upon death go to heaven. That's what Paul thought when he put it, said in Philippians 1.23, that for me to die uh, is to be with Christ, that, that he's in the same place now. Nowhere in the Bible does it, does it ever talk about the resurrection of the spirit, just the resurrection of the dead. So our spirit goes immediately to heaven. Stephen, when he was being attacked and, and being uh, stoned for his witness to the faith, said he saw heaven open and Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. He said, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, that he was going to go there. So, so where do we go when we die? The righteous, I believe they go straight to heaven. Their spirit goes straight to heaven with Jesus. So when someone dies, they say, well, we can say they're in heaven. I think the scripture gives us enough evidence for that. And the second question that I get so often is do people in heaven know what we're doing down here? And I have a lot of thoughts for that, but I'm just gonna stick to, to what the Bible tells you and what I can point out from scripture and not just my own, um, my own thoughts on this subject. Scripture says this in Revelation 6, 9 and 10. It says, when the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the soul of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? So, so do people know what we're doing? We know that they have more than just a, a passive interest in the affairs of the earth. So what do we know about people in heaven now? We know that that they're aware of the activities of the wicked, that those who are being persecuted, they're calling for judgment of those who are persecuting the church. They know what's being done by unrighteous men and they long for vindication for it. They may know, I think they do know, when a sinner repents and they rejoice about it. Look at Luke 15, 10 with me. It's an old verse many of you are probably familiar with, um, but, but I think we need to, to rethink how we think about it. It says, in the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. And we may have known that verse for years, but, but maybe we've missed what it says. We typically read that verse and we say, well, that means that the angels in heaven are rejoicing. And I'm sure that they do. But what does it say? It says there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. Who's in the presence of the angels? the righteous saints who have died. And I believe they're rejoicing, like when we saw Mabry get baptized on the screen. Like I believe they're rejoicing over that. They also watch us. Listen, they also watch us run the Christian race. Hebrews, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, 
uh, the, the, the author of Hebrews, he writes of this whole long list of, uh, about the heroes of our faith. Um, and he tells all of the good things that they've done, and he leaves out all of the bad things, because that's what happens in Jesus. But then in chapter 12, he starts it this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off everything, every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And the image that, that the, the Hebrew writer was trying to get across there would, would have been very well known in their time. It would have been a big coliseum or, or a big arena where the Greeks would hold their sporting events and their, the original Olympics type of thing there. With all of the people in the stands watching and the runners on the field. And what he's saying is that we have these witnesses up there in the stands in heaven watching us run. And that should encourage us. Think about a sports team that has home field advantage. Like, they, they have a better chance at winning because they're at home, because they, they play harder, they're more motivated when they have a group of fans cheering them on. And what he's saying is that we have that advantage, that we should be motivated by, by those who have gone on before us and who have remained faithful. And when you think of all of the righteous saints that are cheering you on, that it should motivate you to continue to be faithful. The righteous in heaven, I think, are very aware of, of what we're doing. But however, the scripture does warn us, and, and, and I hate to even have to say this, but scripture clearly warns the believer against ever trying to contact those who are dead. Like mediums and uh, tarot readings and, and things like that. The scripture is very strict about not trying to reach out to those. Um, but, but I believe that they know what we're doing. Um, the third question and we're going to be done early today, so you guys are going to get a break. It's going to be great. The third question is this, will we know each other in heaven? Like, well, I know Kyle. Well, I know Jennifer. Well, well, I know, will we know each other in heaven? And the Bible says that each person that who will inherit salvation is carefully listed in the Lamb's book of life. That their name, we sang about it in that first song, that, that their name is written down in the book of life. And Jesus even alludes to this when 70 come back from preaching and they're excited and they're, they're all happy saying, hey, we cast out demons in your name and we healed the sick in your name. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, he said this, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Jesus said that we'll sit down and eat with Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah they, they appeared clearly, uh, they appeared, so clearly they kept their identities when, when they appeared with Jesus. And the interesting thing that the disciples, they, they immediately recognized who they are. How did they do that? They'd never seen them. These guys had been dead for, for thousands of years at this point. And I don't think Moses and Elijah had on name tags. Like, I think we will just know each other in heaven. I can't think that the Father will gather his family together as total strangers. Paul expects to know and enjoy his converts in heaven. In 2 Corinthians 1, 4, 14, he said this, even if you don't understand us now, then on the day when Lord Jesus returns, you will be proud of us in the same way that we're proud of you. That we will be reunited with the saints that we love. We'll be introduced to new saints, I believe, that, that we've admired and, and, and make new friendships. Uh, a Baptist preacher, W.A. Criswell, uh, said that he was once asked, will we know each other in heaven? He said, well, we will not really know each other until we get to heaven. That all of the, the masks are stripped away. Now these next three questions uh, get a little bit personal for, for some of you. And I just want to answer them the best that I can. Again, if you disagree with me, that's okay. Um, but this next question is, what about children in heaven? Like everyone has been to a funeral of a child and you've wondered that. And I'm gonna say the Bible makes no reference to, to children in heaven. It's reasonable to assume that God will permit children who have died to spend eternity in a more mature state. Like most likely at the resurrection, a child will receive the glorified body that, that they would have been had, had, they, had they lived. We've been to funerals and people say, oh, I just can't... I can just see the baby sitting in Uncle So-and-So's arms. 
That's a very comforting thought. But the fact is, I don't think the baby will be in heaven, but the person who would, that baby would have been will be there. For example, those who have had a, a miscarriage or, or babies who have been aborted. Like, I will believe that they will be in heaven. I think the light that God intended uh, will not be denied its destiny because of a choice of a person that, that they didn't have a right to make. Think about it. How old was Adam when God created him? You could say one day old. But yet he had appeared to be a young, dynamic man. And I think when we get to heaven, our bodies will reflect that image. Um, when I think of some of the people from, from my childhood, uh, people like uh, Cliff and, and Myra Runk, who were, um, seemed to be 112 when I was five and six years old, and, and they taught my Sunday school class, and they were all bent over and slumped over, um, I don't think that, that I'll see them as old, worn out, crippled people. I think of, of people that I've lost here in the last few years, Willie and, and Ken and Larry and, and all of the others. Like, I don't think that we'll see them in the state that they were in when, when they passed away. I think they'll get a new glorified body that will never be out of its prime. And I think the same thing's true of babies and, and of children, that we will inherit a, a new body and it'll be our maximum capacity to enjoy eternity. Like, I think God loves children too much to let them spend eternity unable to enjoy heaven at its fullest potential. The next question is, why will there be no marriage in heaven? Let's read what Jesus said. The Sadducees, who, who they had a, a very small view of God, they didn't believe in a resurrection uh, from the dead. And they gave him this riddle about a woman who's been married to seven different men, wondering who she would be married to in, in the next life. And this is what Jesus replied. Marriage is for people here on earth. But in the age to come, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die. For they are like the angels. They are God's children since they are children of the resurrection. Let me be clear. Jesus is not saying, we've talked about this a couple of different times in this series. Jesus is not saying we will be angels. Nor is he saying that we will be genderless clones. Heaven is a place that's going to have maleness and femaleness, but not marriage. And, and why not? And, and we can only speculate on that. That's why I said you can form your own opinion. Um, but, but one of the things is that procreation will no longer be needed. When he made Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he told them to multiply and fill the earth. That's not going to be needed in heaven. The number of saints, just like the number of angels, like they will be eternally fixed. Like there's, there's not gonna be new ones. Uh, the second thing, that the reason I believe there'll be no marriage in heaven is that marriage is, it functions as a sign, a sign that actually be no, no longer needed. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter five. He said, a man and a woman become one flesh and they're illustrating the mystery of Christ and his commitment to the church. And that's one of the reasons for purpose of marriage. It's one of the reasons why I believe that Satan is busy attacking marriage. He's trying to destroy that sign. And in heaven, the sign won't be necessary anymore. Like one of the, the chief functions of marriage was to help men and women get to heaven. Like, isn't that the measure of a successful marriage? Whenever everything is considered, a successful marriage is where a man and a woman help each other get to heaven. This is one of the most upsetting thoughts for some about heaven, and I understand why. Some of us have been, had many years with, with the person that we deeply love, and the thought of, of that being eternally ended is disconcerting to us. How can it be heaven without my mate? Listen, the end of, of that partnership doesn't mean the end of a deep relationship. And Jesus was, was sinless, and he loved everybody, but he held a deep affection for some more than others. He had Peter, James, and John who were in his inner circle. And he had a group of 12 who he had a deep relationship with. Then he even had John, uh, the one that he loved, who he had an even closer relationship with. Some were closer to Jesus than others. And this new place will include a new brotherhood of men, but that doesn't preclude the existence of special relationships. 
I think we'll still have them. I suspect that Jennifer and I will have a, a deep bond in heaven. And, and let's just say it, like, how can it be heaven without sex? How, you're thinking it? See? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but do we, really, do, like, do we really think that heaven will be a place of less pleasure than earth? Like in heaven, all of our desires, listen, they will be good desires, and none of them will be frustrating. There are joys far greater than sexual fulfillment that God has in store for us. Besides, there, there, there will be a marriage in heaven. Jesus will be the groom, and we will be the bride, the church. And somehow, I don't think that we'll find that disappointing. And the last question, and maybe the hardest question of all, man, I hope breakfast is ready, because we're going to be done real early. How can it be heaven if my loved ones aren't there? That's a tough question. The Hebrew writer would say that, that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. For joy, he, he endured the cross. Like Jesus is, is happy in heaven, even though multitudes who he loved will not spend eternity with him. How can that be? Perhaps the glories of the next life will simply overwhelm the memories of this life. Isaiah would prophesy in Isaiah 65, 17, he said, see, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Another thing to consider, in the next world, uh, we will come to so much more maturity and, and an understanding of the justice of God that, that than we presently have. We will unflinchingly affirm that all of his judgments, as we stand before him, as we marvel at, at God, his absolute holiness, his righteousness, his purity, like we will not question the judgment of God or wonder why he would send someone to hell. What we will do is we will be overwhelmed by grace and marvel how he could let anybody into heaven. God himself said that, that he would see to it that nobody in heaven will grieve. He said, I will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more crying, there will be no more sorrow, and God keeps his promises. Like I said, these are, these are hard questions, and I'm not gonna pretend that they are perfect answers. That's why I wanted you to write down scriptures, I wanted you to search these things out on your own. But I do believe there is an answer that's a good answer. And that is to believe that the God of heaven is bigger than all of our concerns. And during World War II, the, the King of England uh, ordered an, the evacuation of all the children from the bomb-torn areas of, of London. And so many parents took their, their kids to the train station uh, where they'd be taken to safer parts of the country to, to wait out the worst parts of the war. And the story's told of a mother and a father who put their young son and daughter on one of these trains. And, and as it takes off and they say goodbye, the little girl starts to cry. And she begins to cry because she's scared. She had no idea where, where she's about to go. And brushing away her own tears, the little boy puts his arms around his sister. He says, I don't know where we're going either. But the king knows, so don't worry. And that's the best answer that I can give when we have questions about heaven. He said, in earth, we may not know all of the answers. We, we may not get it 100% right. But the king knows. And the king made a way for us to get to heaven. And when we all get to heaven and we see how great God is, we'll have all of the answers that we need. And as we look at a savior who is willing to suffer and die for us and pay the price for our sin, we will know without a doubt that, that Jesus paid it all. And he is the only way that we can make it to eternity. I'm gonna ask you to stand this morning and... I'm gonna pray and our band's gonna lead us in that song. And today, I said, if you're outside of a relationship with Jesus, I wanna tell you again, there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to that amazing place. And that is by accepting the, the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you on a cross. To, to give your life to him. And if you need to make that decision this morning, we want to, to give you that opportunity. Father God, today, 
We come to you thanking you for the, the hope that we have in, in Christ. And even though we, we may not have all of the answers perfectly to, to all of our questions, that there's enough in your word and enough in the scripture to give us encouragement, to, to motivate us, to spread the good news of, of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray today, if there's anyone here outside of a relationship with, with you, through Jesus, that today would be the day that they accept him. Father, I thank you again that you're pre preparing that place for us. And I look so forward to when Jesus returns to take us to be in that, that amazing place. It's in his name that I pray.
heaven, an amazing place. Bring as many people with you as you can. And in the meantime, bring them here to hear God's word. Have a great week. We will see you here next week. Have a great week.